Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. My name's Dave Marshall and I'm joined by Tom Fletcher and we are looking at episode three of Life on Our Planet. So Tom, can you tell us what this episode is about in 10 seconds? Three, two, one, go. Okay, so episode three is about invaders of the land. We pick up the story of the Devonian mass extinction and we go through the fishes, the amphibians and the first of the reptiles ending in the Permian mass extinction at the end. Oh, it just tipped over into 11 seconds. Oh, I'm sorry. This is, this is error. Not good this enough. is a margin of error. This, this is your fault. You pressed the button wrong. Do uh, not blame me. I nailed it. I, <laughs> this, is not my, what, this is not my doing. But I, uh, you know what? I'm going to th- be positive about this. I, we're getting closer to 10 seconds. By episode <laughs> eight, we're going to nail it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. So... What were you responsible for in this episode? So like, like the rest of the series, I was, I was the scientific advisor, just making sure that uh, every, everything was accurate from the models, the builds of the, the, the extinct animals and the behavior and all that kind of thing. But also uh, fact checking the script, making sure everything's uh, correct in that regard too. Um, and really just setting limits, I suppose, uh, scientific limits to the, the creativity of the storytellers at Silverback, who, uh, I mean, this is one of the most interesting points in prehistory uh so yeah mm. it's, it's a wonderful episode I'm, i really like this one yeah in terms of the scope of the things that happen i absolutely love it i can't get over the fact that you open this episode with lichens oh, oh they're beautiful oh. aren't they yes yeah i mean so that, there was a special technique used uh, to, to film those because obviously they're, they're so so small that to get the focal distance right, yeah, yeah, it's it's super difficult. You have to have a really like narrow uh, plane to get the focus right. So what they did was they stacked images on top of each other while moving the camera around, so that you've got that incredible detail of these things as you're sort of flying through their their miniature world. And uh, yeah, it's stunning. I, I think Lichens is is the unsung hero because they're the, they're the soil builders. They're the OG soil builders. Uh, and it was really important to include them, you know. Even even if on paper they seem uh, boring, they are actually really important and very beautiful. And we'll be talking to producer Sophie Lanfear later all about the decisions that she made as to the scope of the episode, what to include, what not to include, and she goes over a lot of those details as well. And just in general, the evolution of plants, the evolution of forests, the the tree evolution. Very good. Revolution's a good word. I like that. Revolution. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You need to copyright that immediately. <laughs> yeah. And in this episode, I think we've got the highest proportion of crunchy animals, which makes me so happy. <laughs> it's a lovely showcase of arthropods, and it probably has the biggest crunch per. Yeah. The, bi- the biggest crunch ratio to time. Yeah. I completely agree. No, I'm talking about the crunchiest animal ever to exist. Oh, yeah. Arthroplora probably has the most crunch of any organism on the planet that has ever existed. I'm putting that out there. I agree. I agree. I think you're probably correct there. Yeah. Because something like a sea scorpion may be bigger and definitely heavier. It's got more meat inside. But in terms of the sheer amount of exoskeleton, Arthroplora Mm. every time. And you'd hear a, a bigger crunch on land, wouldn't you? Because it's in air rather than under the water. So yeah, I'll give you that one. Like a really big crisp packet. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not just arthropods. There's also a lot of tetrapods. There's a lot of uh, fisherpods. Yeah. Yeah, the, the fisherpods, nobody ever really knew the name of that one. So we just call, called it fisherpod. Uh, of course, yeah, behind the scenes, we, we did. It was, it's strepsidus, it's a rhizodont fish, but um, it was easier for everyone just to, to nickname it fisherpod. <laughs> so I'll give you that one. <laughs> so yeah, we go over the uh, evolution of vertebrates and tetrapods uh, with Professor Mike Benton, and we'll be expanding all upon what a tetrapod is, what an amphibian is, what a reptile, a synapsid, a sauropsid, all of those terms. And we go over a lot of that evolution, accumulating in the greatest mass extinction of all time. 
it's really exciting as well because I, um, when I was doing my undergraduate in Bristol, uh, Professor Benson was my tutor. So uh, I was inspired partially to come to, to Bristol because of the Walking with Dinosaur series, which he helped with. Um, so it's really, it's really nice to come full circle with it and be working on a, a massive documentary with, with him as one of the advisors. It's, yeah, surreal. And amongst all of the fossil reptiles and amphibians, we're also going to be seeing a lot from the modern ones and also speaking to researcher Ida Mae Jones, who actually made quite an interesting contribution to science. Yeah, she she was yeah, are we allowed to talk about that now? Or are you speaking to her about it? Because it, it's incredible. It's it's really, really interesting. Nope, you gotta wait. Okay, fine, good. <laughs> <laughs> I will not steal her fire. No. It was it was a real surprise as well. Like you you watch the scene, okay, strawberry dart forex, watch that scene, see if you notice any small details. Because if you do, then you have just spotted something new to science. Pretty cool. Yeah. But before we get onto that, we should probably do what we do before all of these uh, interviews and talk about our personal favorite scenes. For me, ooh, it is a hard one because, okay, I, I worked on Arthroplora. I, I helped with that model. And I want to say that that is my favorite. And I really like it. I think it's the best Arthroplora that we've ever seen. It's a beautiful um, model. You should be yeah. really proud of it. Thanks. <laughs> it took a lot of work. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. But I, I can't get over, you know, like the the scene with the frogs and the dragonflies. There was such oh, comedy yeah. in that. And I love dragonflies. I think dragonflies are one of the world's most perfect animals. Yes, I, I completely agree. And I, I don't know if, if it was on purpose necessarily, but as we were making this, the dragonfly became a bit of a hero, really, because we, we meet them, you know, back in the Carboniferous with those those huge, great big wingspans. Um, uh, in this episode, we're, we're looking at modern ones and just the, the beautiful slow motion shots that we get of them are just, yeah, they're stunning. But the, the dragonfly is really a symbol of survival because its design has hardly changed in, what, 300 million years. So it, it became a bit, of a bit of a hero of the series in a way. I love the optimistic predation attempts by those frogs yeah yeah there's a yeah you're right there's a lot of comedy in there and um I, yeah it was it was demonstrating a point that there is um even though frogs are smaller than the amphibians we have in in the main episode the, the extinct ones they are um just as just as passionate about catching insects um i love the way that they sort of like grab their mouths as well they they, they fling their arms out and they're waving their arms towards their mouth kind of grappling things towards their mouths yeah, it's, it's the continuation. Okay, the predation attempt, that's ambitious, but it's the commitment to it. It's yeah. the continuation. It's, I'm going to see this through yeah, all the absolutely. way to the end. <laughs> I bet once they land, they're there chewing on nothing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's like yeah. buying a lottery ticket and then acting like a millionaire, even though you've not won anything. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm buying a boat. It, it's, I mean, it's, it's so nice to be able to have the the natural history alongside the VFX like we do because it, it's so important to to show modern bi modern biodiversity and to show those those kinds of things that you can't really get away with when you're you're doing VFX that you know that those frogs leaping into the air and and doing barrel rolls and all that kind of stuff to catch dragonflies is bonkers. It, it's absolutely bonkers, but it's real. And you can't really do that with extinct animals, even though we know that elephants today can swim, peacocks can fly. You can't really do that kind of thing with extinct animals because the, the audience just wouldn't accept it. So it's nice to be able to show quite how crazy modern animals behave sometimes and to illustrate mm. an evolutionary point, especially. So Tom, what was your favorite scene? So previously, I think I've chosen natural history sequences. So I'm going to choose a, um, a VFX one this time my absolute favorite one it will come as no surprise i i imagine but it's the fish um that crawls out onto the land we, we know now that there's there's about 100 different fish alive today that are in some way amphibious so things like mud fish and, and lung fish all that kind of thing are the obvious ones but lots of fish do it and in this particular scene we have strepsidus which is a, a rhizodont fish living amongst the, the 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 roots and twigs of this quite shallow swampy environment and 
it's really special. It's such a cool thing to see when it's using its lobe fin to grapple through that vegetation, because that's probably how lobe fins evolved in the first place. You know, it wasn't to walk around on land straight away. There had to be a middle ground between water and land where the, these really stout, powerful front f- fins were were useful. And so getting through that tangle of, of roots was really useful. And there's a little scene, there's a little shot where um, the, the lobe fin is just resting on the branch and pushing its way through. And I, I'm going to be using that in lectures for, for years to come. And the, um, I'm sure other people have talked about this, but the attention to detail of the animators on that was exquisite. We got, we got the model itself is beautiful. Per Alberg um, helped with that enormously. And uh, that looks beautiful. Again, we started with the skin first and then worked inwards. And um, yeah, it's it's a really charismatic little animal and the attention to detail of things like the sand moving out of the way it, of its fins and all that kind of thing really embeds it in that world. And yeah, for me, that's an absolute highlight of the series, in fact. Um, am I right in thinking that there's fish today that are obligate air breathers? Hmm, apart from us? I'm not sure. Um, so yes, uh, no, you, you are right. You're right. So there are there are labyrinth fishes. So things like Siamese fighter fish and gouramis. And I think I'm right in saying that they have to come to the surface to breathe um, in their particular environments, which are quite stagnant and there's not very much dissolved oxygen in the water. Um, probably the best example though is the electric eel, which if you did, if you <laughs> if you were um, it's so inclined, if you held it underwater, it, it would it would drown. So yeah, they are obligate. Well, Tom, I hope you and indeed all of our audience enjoy these interviews on episode three, and I will see you again, hopefully, at the start of episode four. Episode three is an absolute corker. It's been a pleasure, Dave. Thank you.